originate. That means they're the ones that go out and find the people that uh, will take the uh, mortgages, that they will borrow the money, and now they have something that can be turned into a security. They can be sold on the secondary market. Michael mentioned Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But by the way, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not even the biggest players, uh, global biggest players in this uh, secondary market for uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, some of the other, uh, uh, Merrill Lynch, which has gone under Lehman Brothers, which has gone under Citicorp, which is about to go under and so forth. All of them were involved in this. Now, uh, so, now why, okay, why are these people who are, you know, supposedly so smart and making so much money, well, uh, what, was the, what was the mistake they made here? Now, the, the notion was this. The notion is, look, you bundle these things, okay, so we have all the people in the neighborhood, and then we have many neighborhoods, and you bundle them all into a big package, and that enables you, on the basis of the law of averages, if you're going to have some risky ones, okay, those are at one tail of the distribution of your big uh, bundle of mortgages, but those highly risky uh, mortgages are balanced because you have so many others that are not risky. Right? And even if, even if you say, okay, let's bundle together a bunch of the real risky ones, uh, even those, you say, look, the default rate is, even for risky ones, is, you know, five, six, seven percent. So yes, why don't we buy insurance? We will have a system of insurance, and that's what Michael was talking about. That's a, a second sphere of a securitization. So you, you have these, what are perceived to be safeguards, within a system which enables you to carry what otherwise, under normal circumstances, would be highly risky assets. Now, what's, what was wrong with the logic? The, what was wrong with the logic was that they ignored a very, very simple thing. And this, by the way, is the same mistake that long-term capital management made, our Nobel laureates in economics, which is they didn't understand the nature of systemic risk. They understood the nature of individual risk, that households uh, you know, when you lend somebody money, there's a risk that they don't pay you back. But most people will, and that's how you balance your portfolio. So that's individual risk. But systemic risk is the process whereby you create a financial bubble. So everything's going up together, and then look, everything looks great. You know, look, people actually aren't defaulting. In fact, they've got a lot of money there, and they're borrowing against value of their home and they're spending money and the economy is moving forward and they're paying back their loans. But when the, the, the financial, the housing market bubble burst because housing prices had deviated so far from what they had been historically, it was about to inevitably going to burst. So the housing market burst and the, the failure of the logic was to see, look, when the housing market uh, burst, then all the entire portfolio, which it seemed to have uh, you know, brilliantly balanced, risky versus less risky, everything became risky. The whole portfolio became risky, and that's why you see these major institutions on the verge of collapse. These institutions that have been around for generations, they failed to see this basic uh, simple point in logic. How could, they, how could they mess up like that? How could they fail to see this? Well, uh, number one, they failed to see it. Look, the Nobel Prize winners failed to see it. it the economic, my own field, the Amy's field of economics, uh, doesn't think in terms of these systemic risks. Uh, they think in terms of just individual risk. They don't think that capitalism, they, they look at history and they don't see the thing which I just told you, which is that financial crises are endemic to the history of capitalism. So they, they missed this simple point. On top of that, you have what we could call an asymmetric reward structure. We start with the originators. Now the way, the real way the originators make money is not, they, they aren't going to earn the interest because the, the mortgage is going to get sold and sold and sold and sold. So what really happens is they make money off of selling the mortgages. So it's, they have, their incentive is not to find people that they can't make, uh, lend money to. Their incentive is to say, oh sure, they, you know, we can lend to so and so. It's okay, and then all they have to do is convince somebody else 
that the bundle of mortgages they have you know, are viable. They make fees. They make money off of fees. And then in the secondary market, if you can sell a bundle, you can rebundle the mortgage, or you can put an insurance policy on top of the initial bundle, you make fees. So the, the asymmetry is this. The, the, the advantages, the real money is always saying yes. You don't make money off of saying no. That goes all the way up to the uh, ratings agencies, Standard and Poor, Moody's, and so forth. You know, 80% of the uh, securitized mortgages were rated AAA. That means the lowest possible risk. Now, it obviously was way, way off. <laughs> way off. But uh, at the time, you know, if you are a rating agency, your job is to get people that will hire you to rate. And the best way to get people to, you know, to hire you to rate is to kind of say, you know what, you're going to get an A, just like, you know, I don't know if the professor's here. If you want to get a lot of students in your class, give out all A's. Uh, so that was kind of the logic. And so there really wasn't anything there to stop it. Now, as I said, this is part of the uh, long-term trajectory of global capitalism. I want to mention a book uh, called Mania's Panics and Crashes, A History of Financial Crises, uh, by somebody named Charles Kindleberger, who taught for many years at MIT. And it's basically a, a history of what we're talking about. So you don't have to believe me in saying that this is part of the normal trajectory of capitalism. It's in Kindleberger's book. And Kindleberger's book is a history based on a theoretical approach of someone named Hyman Minsky. Uh, Hyman Minsky was a professor at Washington University in St. Louis for many years, died about 10 years ago, and basically uh, was somebody who, who explained this uh, systemic problem of financial instability and was basically shunned his whole academic career. Um, I actually wrote an article about this uh, last week in Nation magazine. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the Wall Street Journal ran a feature a, a year ago saying, the economy has now, re the global economy has reached its Minsky moment. Well, the Minsky moment's been around for a long, long time. It just, no, and, and the article also said, this obscure professor that nobody ever heard of, well, Amy heard of him. Uh, I was <laughs> teaching Minsky, and, and you know, the ideas in Minsky are uh, what uh, the profession needed to hear, but just essentially, for the most part, chose not to hear. Now, in the back of Kindleberger's book, this history, there's actually an appendix where he lays out the history of financial crisis. I just did the last 20 years in the United States. Kindleberger does it uh, for like 250 years. And I did a really technical econometric exercise to try to grasp the, you know, the essential features of what's in Kindleberger's uh, appendix, which is I, okay, see if you can follow this. This is highly technical. I, I counted all the crises. And it starts in like 1750, one, two, three, four, five. I counted down the list, and then, this was the real tricky part, I divided the number of uh, crises by the number of years. <laughs> so that was it. That was my econometric exercise. Now, here's what you come out with. If you do that exercise, you come out with uh, a financial crisis in the major capitalist economies occurring every 8.5 years from 1760, I think, to the present. 